he and co-founder. If you haven't seen it, Go Local broke a story last night that Dave Darlington, former top aide to Governor Lincoln Almon, is looking to run as the Republican uh, in 2022 for governor of the state of Rhode Island. So you can check that out. And also, exclusive story this morning, uh, Go Local got a copy of an investigative report on the workplace in the city hall in Providence, Rhode Island, found it to be, quote, toxic. Take a look at that story. It has implications not only for City Hall, but also for Lieutenant Governor Matos. Uh, a lot of this uh, alleged abuse took place in the City Council office or in the City Clerk's office while she was City Council president. So take a look at both those stories. Let's go to Courtney Nicolato. She runs the United Way of Rhode Island. She has a big, bold uh, proposal with federal dollars coming into Rhode Island. Courtney, thanks so much for joining us. Josh, always a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Okay, about a billion dollars is uh, sit literally sitting in a bank account uh, in the state of Rhode Island. It's federal funds uh, provided to help with the recovery from the pandemic. Uh, none of the dollars have been spent to date. I think the state's had it for six months or more. Mm -hmm. And you have a big proposal. Let's, let's talk about what you and others are proposing to utilize a significant amount of these dollars for. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and, you know, we are concerned that these dollars have not been spent yet. And here each and every day um, from 2 on one from callers who are in desperate mode, you know, mode, they are in uh, losing and being evicted from their homes. And so we need to move quicker. And the Homes Rhode Island Coalition, which we are a proud member of and have been since its inception, um, has put a proposal forward uh, to the multiple entities who are looking at how we spend ARPA funding and are, is proposing $500 million of that $1.1 billion be utilized and leveraged in building, maintaining, creating accessibility for safe and affordable housing here in our state. Uh, listen, you've been on before. We've written about it numerous times. Rhode Island has a Listen, we, we've always had a housing crisis. We really have a supercharged housing crisis. You've got a number of things taking place simultaneously. You've got a rapid increase in the median household price of a single family home. To give you an example, we're gonna pierce $400,000. That knocks out about half of Rhode Island from being able mm -hmm. to afford uh, a single family home. Uh, coupled with very little uh, new stock of housing, and even when it does come on, apartments, these upscale apartments that have been coming online in Providence, they seem to get scooped away. Brown University bought River House, 174 units, uh, small apartments, micro apartments over at the arcade are now being turned into condos. So that's over 230, I want to say, uh, mm -hmm. units coming off the board. Talk about the, the problem. Yeah, you know, there's a multitude of numbers and research that has been done by economists, including economists here in the state of Rhode Island, that has shown that we are tens of thousands. I think the last number I saw was about 25,000 units short of safe and affordable housing here in the state of Rhode Island. In as well, we're actually seeing more um, rental units come offline because of various issues that they may have, lead contaminants, et cetera, than are actually coming online every year. And so we continue to take that deficit and build upon it. You know, at the same time, you said exactly the right thing. You know, we are seeing costs for average median homes go up significantly. I will say even since I moved back home three years ago, it's been unbelievable to see what my house um, has continued to grow. And everybody is seeing the same thing. Problem is, is that, you know, we, minimum wage is still well below livable wage. Folks who were already in crisis or close to crisis are now deep, deep, deep in crisis. We're seeing 400 Families on average every week be evicted from their homes and have absolutely nowhere to go. We're seeing homeless numbers skyrocket. And so, you know, as we think about safe and affordable housing and the building of safe and affordable housing, it brings jobs, it brings economic opportunity to our state, it brings additional tax revenue, and it helps ensure Rhode Island's stay, Rhode Islanders stay in Rhode Island because housing is one of the major issues why we're seeing folks leave. And so housing, in my opinion, is the fundamental foundational element of our economic opportunity and mobility here in the state. And we have not given it the attention that it, so it really truly deserves. But do we have a tease? You know, we've always 
uh, we, both of us grew up here in Rhode Island. We know mm -hmm. uh, housing to be, especially for the Northeast, to be affordable. We don't think of it as affordable, and, but in comparison to Connecticut or Massachusetts, it's very affordable. And now we're suffering uh, in part because of the pandemic in which residents from out of state, New York, Connecticut, and Massachusetts primarily, are coming here to buy homes and work uh, from home or buy a second home. All cash buyers, I can buy a beautiful house down near the water for a million dollars. I could never do that in Long Island or, or in Massachusetts. These are, these are good buys for these people. Is that part of the problem that we just have an unreal mismatch of what our wages are and what our housing uh, prices are? It's certainly part of it, and it's certainly a combination. Um, you know, when we think about luxury homes and ability for luxury homes, we find that, you know, you're right, folks from out of state are coming in. They are making Rhode Island their home. It is a beautiful place to live, and, uh, you know, there's lots of reasons why Rhode Island is a great place. The problem is when folks in luxury homes don't have places to go, they go and they have to downsize. And so they then have, you know, and then that. Uh, level and that tier has to continue to downsize. So it is this like vicious spiral downward. Um, and then we're finding more folks are sleeping in their cars, more folks are um, sleeping on folks' couches. Like this is, you know, just skyrocketing all the way through. I think the other thing, you know, to mention is that they there is a, a rule in place or a law in place that says that as new development comes in, whether it's luxury or safe and affordable, that 10% of it has to guarantee be allocated towards that. Unfortunately, not all um, zoning commissions and other groups are following that letter to the law. We find, I believe there's only one community out of the 39 who is currently meeting the 10% threshold. It's a negotiation tactic. Um, and, you know, it's great that we're building, you know, more uh, luxury homes and apartments and others, but that's not where we need it the most. We need it truly where folks who are working um, who are working multiple jobs. You know, the other thing I think about regularly is lower housing costs and affordability of housing, which means we'll have more disposable income in our state, which means we have more dollars to support local business. I will tell you, I, you know, living in Texas for 13 years, that was their philosophy. Their philosophy was to try to keep housing costs down, more disposal income, more money into the system, into the economy. And so, you know, we are losing out on that as well. Yeah, a, a big point, because a lot of people, just to compete, are, ha are what's called house poor. They've got so much of their income going into paying their rental cost uh, or their mortgage and taxes. So absolutely. Let me play devil's advocate with you sure. a little bit for this $500 million. It's half the money. I mean, we've got mm -hmm. problems in our health care system. We've got problems in our educational structure. We've got clearly problems in our economic development infrastructure. Mm -hmm. We've got problems across the board. Why is this uh, worth half the money? Yeah, it's a great question and, and valid. I think there's a couple of things to note around. You know, there are additional dollars coming into the state from a stimulus perspective for other areas. So education is a good example. Is that not every dollar we need? No, not by any means, but it is an influx of dollars that are coming in. We see rental assistance is coming in as well. So, you know, that's great, but unfortunately that does not meet the need on building and helping us with the root cause and the issues. So yes, there is a lot of absolutely um, appropriate places and spaces that we should be investing in these, these dollars. But housing, to me, again, is at the foundation of our economic opportunity, our economic mobility, our ability to uh, see folks thrive, our ability to keep folks in Rhode Island. Uh, you know, this truly can be. And I will tell you, if you look at average costs per kid in education, if you look at average costs spent in many of the areas that you spoke to, the investment is higher than it is per capita in housing. And so, you know, lots of folks talk about this as a, uh, a windfall of dollars uh, for our state. This is a past due bill, in my opinion, as it relates to housing especially. Okay, but the state did get $200 million in rental mm -hmm. assistant dollars, and Go Local flagged the problem, I think, before any of the national media of the, of the 
inability to get the dollars out, I think we wrote about it first in June, they'd only gotten mm -hmm. $1 million out, that the dollars yep. had actually been delivered in February. It's now mm -hmm. up to around $25 million. It's a fraction of the amount of money Rhode Island has access to. That's $175 yeah. million dollars in housing money, especially since the president loosened the rules a few weeks ago in a press conference at the White House that gave the state and the landlords and the renters a lot more flexibility in how to collect the money and how the money could be used. That's a big pot of money sitting there, and it does not seem at the pace that we are going that we're going to even hit $50 million of the $150 million. And add one more, at a year from now, roughly, if we don't have that money spent, it goes back to the feds, and that is mandated in the statute. Yeah. Correct. You're totally right. And I am deeply concerned that, and I think the last number I heard was about $30 million worth of rental assistance that's gone out. And I know that the team at Rhode Island Housing and their partners are moving fe feverishly to try to get us to a place where more folks are having access. But unfortunately, it's not moving fast enough. And some of that is what Rhode Island is is putting together for documentation requirements that aren't aligned with the federal regulations. Um, we can't make this as even an ounce more difficult for folks to access uh, these critical dollars. But I think it's also important to note that rental assistance is critically, critically important, and I hope we use every last dollar that we have. But it is not the answer to the root cause. It is the band-aid that absolutely needs to be in place right now. And But we have to be talking about our inventory. We have to be talking about building. We have to be talking about lead remediation. We have to be talking about getting us to a place where homelessness is not rising, but falling. And that is why I think the, you know, 500 million or the lion's share of the investment of that 1.1 uh, billion should be going uh, to this work. Courtney Nicolato, you get the last word. Uh, I know you've had lots of conversations with the governor's office and legislative leaders. What's that message that you're giving them right now? You know, I, I think many uh, folks have been thinking about what we need to do from an ARPA perspective, how we need to be spending these dollars. And there's no question we need to be looking at long-term solutions, not short-term solutions. You know, we have a number of areas, as you mentioned, housing, education, and others, where we have critical, critical issues and crises that need a long-term vision that supersedes whoever is sitting in the elected official role. And so I think we need to stop looking and viewing what others are doing in community. Rhode Island, in fact, is last. Um, in uh, beginning to spend the ARPA dollars, we need to move forward and really truly create long-term solutions um, and long-term plans. Housing needs a long-term plan. And I think these dollars are the perfect opportunity for us to build that plan and then execute it on it, utilizing these incredibly important funds. Courtney Nicolato runs the United Way of Rhode Island. Thank you so much for joining us. For everybody else, uh, Chair of the Political Science Department at the University of Virginia, Jennifer Lawless, will be joining us at 1 o'clock to discuss the chaos in Washington right now. Uh, President Biden's administration and his legacy is hanging by a thread over in the House of Representatives. She'll have a real-time update on that. And if you haven't gotten vaccinated, excuses are over. Uh, it's time to get vaccinated. It's, try it's time to keep yourself safe and your family and your friends. Thanks, everybody. We'll be back at 1 o'clock with Jennifer Laws. Thanks.